So, I'm going to start talking about impingement versus chromioclavicular test, which we'll come back to those in a couple of minutes, but a lot of them go hand in hand, right? Nears compression test. Elevate the patient to about 90 to 120 degrees. Inflection. Stabilize the scapula and do overpressure. Does that hurt? negative test. If you don't stabilize the scapula, you should just keep going back. What was the problem with that test? It's not specific. It's not specific. It's, it's fairly specific. It hurts. Now, if I stabilize, and I'm, my personal mechanics aren't good here because I'm trying to let you see. If I stabilize him so that his scapula cannot elevate with the motion, then I create impingement, don't I? Because mm -hmm. it's normal. We talked about this morning. The normal mechanics is that scapula has got to rotate and elevate. So if I hold him down here and just keep pushing, I'm going to create impingement. So that's the problem with the near test. So Dr. Hawkins, Richard Hawkins, came along and he said, well, we'll do it this way. And we'll bring him still playing the scapula, maybe a little bit more flexion, and then internally rotate him. So why would that create a greater tuberosity? So as I internally rotate him, I force the greater tuberosity under the acromial arch and create impingement. But both of these, I think you can appreciate, would create some acromioclavicular compression, right? So you want to have the patient distinguish to some degree where they feel those symptoms. The test I prefer is what I call the AIP or active impingement test but I can't find it in a textbook, therefore it cannot be on your board exams, according to Rita. But I have him take his right hand, I'll do it with, with the non-involved, we're going to assume this is the involved. So we take his left hand, grab his right shoulder. Does that hurt? No. <laughs> if it hurt, we suspect AC compression or there is a corticochromial impingement syndrome. The corticoid process is also being compressed here. More commonly, AC. Right? So if that hurts, not impingement. If that hurts, impingement. So you do it on the left side, and, and I like this test, because very rarely will people say, oh, that doesn't, I feel like it's fine. Now do it with the involved side. Said, oh, yeah, I feel that. I feel a little pitch in my shoulder. It's not threatening to the patient. doesn't risk tissues, et cetera. So that's the active impingement test. The other type of distinction that we're also seeing, and you haven't had the lecture yet, so bear with me, but we have now further divided internal versus external impingement. For the most part, when somebody talks about having an impingement syndrome, they are talking about subacromial space, supraspinatus tendon, bursa, biceps, long head tendon, that kind of thing. There is also an internal impingement syndrome, which we test by doing the apprehension, and we're going to come back and talk about that in a little bit. Okay, and that's a different issue. That one goes more with GERD, not with instability, but it is a different type of an impingement type of syndrome. Okay? So that's those. Cuff tests, we don't have great tests in my opinion. Poppendefeld describes the drop arm. You have the patient elevate slightly into the pain of the scapula, hold their arm in that position, push down. If the arm breaks, a so-called clasp knife release, you know what I'm talking about if you ever had a pocket knife, they're spring-loaded, and when it gets close to the end, it just pops into place. That's what that is, so it drops out. However, People that have any acute pathology in the shoulder don't usually like to add a lot of shoulder tension through the deltoid and the cuff muscles. So I don't think it's a great test, but it's one you can do. I just don't think if you've got a positive drop arm test that you can say they have a torn rotator cuff. With me? Okay. Empty can test. I think I mentioned to you this morning that was first described by um, uh, the empty can was Dr. Job and his colleague was not Kerwin. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Plane of the scapula, so not flexion, not abduction, halfway, approximately. 
What that inferior lines, the scapula with the angle of the rib with the humerus, and gets everything in a straight line and then isolates into the supraspinatus. Since somewhat refuted in the literature and saying actually full can versus empty can is better indication. Should you do both? Yeah. But I think you introduce impingement for the reason you guys just talked about. In this position, I'm going to have more impingement because the greater tuberosity is being internally rotated versus external. Same things happen to some degree with O'Brien's test, which we're going to do last. Okay, liftoff we really already did as part of the manual muscle testing, but those are specifically for rotator cuff, right? And more specifically for the subscapularis. Rotator cuff tears are usually supraspinatus. Is it possible to isolate it away from the deltoid? Not really. Probably. Its function is more isometric if you look at the EMG studies but the middle deltoid and it work just really hand in hand. So, and it's the one that's torn the most, so we can't. We can isolate probably a little bit subscap, and according to the literature, we can isolate teres minor, and that's that hornblower's test. So we do a hornblower's test. Again, you bring the patient into flexion. You have them internally rotate, stabilize their scapula, and ask them to externally rotate in that position. And back down. Minor. 